This conference will now be recorded. Well, good morning, everyone. I want to thank you all for participating in our 23rd COVID-19 conference call. For those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Wayne Mitchell, and I'm the president and CEO of the Nacogdoches County Chamber of Commerce. Uh, again, I want to remind you that this call will be recorded and that members of the media have been invited to participate as well. Um, and uh, these calls have generated uh, literally over 60 uh, uh, media stories. So uh, we're very pleased with our media partners for their uh, assistance in distributing the uh, information that we're able to, uh, to cultivate from these calls. Uh, today, we're going to ask everyone on this call uh, to please put your phones and your computers on mute until we're ready for the questions section. Um, we're also um, going to ask if you have any questions for Mr. Furlow, if you'd please submit them under the chat section of the GoToMeeting site, which is the upper right-hand column of your, uh, of your page. You'll see it, and you can just submit them there, and then we'll relay the questions from there. Um, I do want to take a moment and, and thank everybody for participating. These calls have been uh, very well attended and uh, uh, hopefully they're of benefit to everybody that's participating uh, uh, and that we find uh, interesting uh, uh, presenters and uh, today is no exception. Uh, for the purpose of introduction, it's my pleasure to introduce to you the president and CEO of Commercial Banks of Texas, a fellow I'm deeply indebted to because uh, Probably had it not been for Rusty Rust, I wouldn't be sitting in this seat. I'd be back home uh, getting ready to uh, freeze uh, uh, freeze for the winter in Maine. But uh, thanks to Rusty's good judgment, uh, I'm sitting in this, uh, in this wonderful seat here at the Nacogdoches Chamber. So would you folks please say good morning to Rusty Rust. Good morning, Rusty. Thank you, Wayne. We appreciate all that you've done for the for the community of, as I said, we're a better place because you've you've been here and worked with our community with all your talents and abilities. So we appreciate that. And it's my pleasure today to introduce Chris Furlow to the to the group. I had the privilege of of meeting Chris when uh, TBA was looking for a new leader. Uh, it actually happened about a year after we had retained Wayne and got him to come here. I was on the committee that that uh, met with Chris and several others. Chris rose to the top of that that group and became the president and chief executive officer of the Texas Bankers Association. The TBA is the oldest and largest state banking association in the United States. It advoca advocates in Austin and in Washington. We train more than 8,000 community bankers annually, and we provide nationally recognized banking products and services. It invests in Texas communities through financial literacy, scholarship, and charitable activities. Now, Chris previously served as the president of Ridge Global, which was an international risk management consulting firm where he helped clients in, in financial services and other sectors leverage resilience for competitive advantage. Chris has a very extensive background and resume. I'm just gonna hit a couple of the highlights. Chris has a background in complex policy and regulatory issues in both public and private sector. After the 9-11 attacks, he was named the Director for State Affairs in the White House Office of Homeland Security, where he served as a liaison to all 50 governors. During the stand-up of the United States Department of Homeland Security, he was appointed Executive Director of Homeland Security Advisory Council, where he led the operations of the department's cross-disciplinary public and private sector committees and served as a senior advisor to Secretary Tom Ridge. Chris brings more than 25 years of legislative and political experience to the TBA. He served as the Deputy U.S. Assistant Secretary of Commerce and as an aide on Capitol Hill. He also was the executive director of the Louisiana Republican Party. Chris currently serves on the board of trustees for the Southwestern Graduate School of Banking and as the Smith Hutton chair of the Banking Advisory Board at Sam Houston State University. Today, Chris, we won't hold that against you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Doug. <laughs> 2019, Chris was appointed as the private sector as a member of the Texas Cybersecurity Council. He previously served as the U.S. Chamber of Commerce National Security Task Force and Cyber Leadership Council. Chris is married as uh, a wife who's actually a Texas A&M grad, proud Aggie, and four chick kids, and as he says, two not-so-well-trained bird dogs. So, Chris, <laughs> with that, I'll also tell folks that one of the first thing you did when you came to move to Texas is came to Nacogdoches to the Fredonia Hotel and visited our community. And we appreciate you for that. And so with that, I'll turn it over to you, Chris. 
Yeah, and you bet. What a great job they did over at the Fredonia Hotel. I mean, I've gotten to travel in a lot of places, and uh, finding that jewel in, in East Texas, it really is great. So uh, I, I can't wait to, to, to get back. And, Rusty, I have to thank you. You are certainly a tremendous leader for the Nacogdoches area, but, but for the banking community in Texas as well. Rusty and I speak probably at least weekly, and I can tell you, uh, as we look at policies that are going to impact banking, Rusty is always asking the question about how is it going to impact bank customers. So he's a good man, and Rusty, we're certainly grateful for your service as vice chairman of, uh, of TBA. Wayne, I certainly need to thank you for, for this opportunity. Um, you know, TBA is the oldest and largest state banking association in the country, and we have a proud history. But if you want to talk about a proud history, all you have to do is start in Nacogdoches. Uh, being the oldest town in Texas, man, I get that. I, I love that. Um, East Texas really is a, a, a special place. Um, Y'all know that, but I think it's always good to have someone from 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 outside of East Texas tell tell you that. Um, you know, it's a wonderful place to raise a family, a great place to have a business, um, and there's just richness to not only what's above and below the ground, but in the people and the goodness of the people and. I, there's a story to tell there, and that's what Wayne does. The Nacogdoches County Chamber does just a, a tremendous job of telling that story. So I want to congratulate you and your business leadership, and especially want to congratulate you for what you've been doing during coronavirus, uh, because the pandemic has obviously put a lot of strains on folks uh, in the business community, and you've done a great job of keeping folks unified, especially through these calls. Uh, so I want to thank you for that and, and congratulate you for doing that. What I thought I might do is just share a little bit of information about the Texas Bankers Association. Um, I would really like to focus on a lot of the connections between the banking industry and particularly our other sectors of the economy in the state of Texas, uh, especially our community banks, and, and right back to each of your, your businesses. Uh, we have about 500 banks in the state of Texas. That's more than any other state. Uh, the Texas Bankers Association represents over 400 uh, of those banks. And uh, what many folks don't realize, even here in Texas, that's over a trillion dollars in bank assets in the state of Texas. Uh, that's, that's a lot. <laughs> and I can tell you what's really, really cool about that is that TBA represents banks of every size, but 97% of our bank members are community banks. So it's these community banks that underpin this global Texas economy that's the 10th largest on the planet. And, you know, that is unique to Texas. And that brings great value in the international marketplace to Texas. Um, banks are, are, are relatively easy to stereotype. There's the old saying of uh, why do criminals rob banks? And that's where the money is. And uh, well, there are some folks in D.C. in the political class who think an awful way is uh, awful lot like those uh, bank robbers. Uh, we are highly regulated. Um, and when folks want to look at, look at, uh, at revenues, a lot of times they're going to look at banks. And um, what they fail to realize often in the political class is uh, a lot of times their policies will directly impact the communities that the banks serve. Uh, the availability of, of sound credit, the ability for small businesses to be able to get the capital that they need uh, to sustain themselves or to grow their, their businesses, uh, for families uh, to, to grow and succeed. And in Texas, our community banks are really the small and family owned businesses that support other small and family owned businesses. The average asset size of a TBA member bank is $243 million. So you can see how within the context uh, of the, the Texas banking system, over a trillion dollars in assets, it's really made up of community banks. Uh, you're gonna certainly find them uh, in the oil patch, in our rural and ag communities. And I think that's what's so important about the Texas banking system and how it is directly connected to these other critical industries uh, in the state of Texas. I thought what I would do is quickly touch on a couple of current issues. Uh, that really demonstrate this connectivity and this interdependency between our banking system in Texas and our business community. And obviously, it is, uh, it's something that's, that's tied to what's been happening related to, to COVID. Um, I like to say that uh, our community banks in Texas are tapped into the real 
economy. And that real economy is local. It's what you see in Nacogdoches and across uh, East Texas. Uh, it's in our ag communities and it's in the oil patch. And what happens in the local economy and that real economy, as I call it, doesn't always show up in a bureaucrat spreadsheet in DC. And I'm gonna give this uh, example of the PPP program. Um, I, I think there's an awful lot of folks who wanna claim credit for the PPP program and how it has saved jobs. Um, I certainly have a, a perspective on that. Um, banks in Texas helped to make over 400,000 PPP loans totaling almost $41 billion. That's real money. But I think the real important part of that is that over 2.6 million Texas jobs were saved. And I think that's a relatively conservative number, um, saving the jobs of, of neighbors in, in the communities. Now, as the banks went to go do this, there were, there were some promises that, that, that were made on the front end from the federal government. Um, and they were made to not only to the banks administering the loans, but uh, to uh, small business owners. Uh, the small business owners were told, hey, go get the money. These things are like grants. And they told the banks, hey, get the money out. We're gonna streamline this program. We're gonna make it uh, uh, more effective than previous SBA programs. Um, but how that panned out, uh, and we could understand this because it was done so quickly, but um, certainly we ran into some issues. Some of them were related to technology. Some of you uh, who may have uh, folks you know that, uh, that received the PPP uh, loans may have encountered some tech problems initially. Uh, getting in uh, for, for our banks, supporting our, our small businesses. But at the end of the day, it was really the banks providing their liquidity, their staff resources uh, to in essence advance the federal government on the PPP program. And a lot of folks don't know that. They thought that was purely government money going out. And in essence, it was the banks uh, leveraging their liquidity. Uh, bank employees all across the state of Texas, I can tell you, and especially in the early days of PPP, uh, over the Easter time frame, uh, they were working over holidays and weekends, uh, certainly behind the scenes to get PPP dollars out to their small business customers. And, and why did they do it? It's because like y'all know uh, Rusty and the many bankers in the Nacogdoches area, they know the people in their communities. They know that the business owners needed help to keep their doors open and to protect the jobs of their employees. And what it really turned out to being was a, a partnership between the banks and small businesses to keep our communities going. Um, in regard to those promises made by the federal government, banks were supposed to be paid some fees uh, and it was in statute within five days. Well, it took more than 12 weeks. And why that's a problem and why I mention our banks as being small businesses themselves, they were strategizing how they were gonna use their liquidity based on that promise from the federal government. So that was a challenge that our banks have had to look at and, 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 and overcome uh, throughout this process. Um, the forgiveness process is a piece that I think is really important. As we talk about the success of the PP program, PPP pro program in saving jobs and keeping our small businesses afloat, um, the forgiveness process I think will define it. And uh, there were some issues with that in Washington. Originally, uh, Treasury and SBA came out with an 11-page forgiveness document. Um, that was going to be a burden to small businesses who, as they're trying to keep the doors open, uh, were also going to be facing this, this paperwork uh, issue. I can tell you I have a photograph of uh, one bank had sent me what the forgiveness was going to look like based on that 11-page document and it included a binder that was this thick. Um, so there was a great uproar that uh, the Texas Bankers Association, many of our peer groups uh, across the country and the larger business community really fought to get what we called at the time, easy uh, forgiveness, that the form would be much like a, a 1040 easy form for, for taxes. Well, when SBA and Treasury came out with that second effort, it was a seven page document and they kind of taken the easy moniker and attached it to the seven page document. And I will tell you only in Washington DC uh, can they create a three page form that requires four pages of instructions and calculators and potentially outside advisors. So uh, we are continuing to fight 
uh, to make that process easier because right now the seven page document is what's in place. Um, and we're especially fighting for uh, businesses that are, uh, who took out loans uh, from PPP uh, at $150,000 and below because that's really the majority uh, of the uh, program participants. In Texas, it's 86% of the participants took out 150 uh, and below. So for us at the Texas Bankers Association, really trying to uh, uh, communicate with our legislators in Washington, D.C., uh, we really want to pressure the congressional leadership in both parties right now. We've had some pretty good success in Texas in working uh, with our delegation. Uh, for example, uh, there is a bill, it's uh, called S-4117. It is sponsored by Senator Kevin Kramer uh, out of North Dakota. And what it would do is it would provide, pro provide forgiveness with a one-page form, a simple attestation by the PPP small business borrower that they utilize the funds primarily to save jobs in accordance with the CARES Act. Um, that, as opposed to this seven-page document, that uh, many small business people are gonna have to come back to the bank and try to get assistance and, and really be focused in on paperwork. So um, what I really wanna communicate today is that uh, our banks are really partners with our small businesses in trying to make this process as easy as possible. We understand that our small businesses have to get back to work and nobody wants to be uh, fooling with paperwork. There is um, great bipartisan support uh, for this bill. Um, and uh, if, if you look at uh, who's supporting it, there are 30 members of the United States Senate that are on board. I will tell you that our senators from Texas have really stood up. They were early supporters, Senator Cornyn and Senator Cruz, and we're, we're grateful uh, for them standing with small businesses and our community banks uh, on that issue. Also over on the House of Representatives side, uh, there is a bipartisan group of 11 members of the Texas uh, U.S. House delegation that are co-sponsors to the House companion legislation to, to that bill. Uh, I know that uh, uh, Congressman Louis Gohmert is one of those. We're certainly grateful uh, to him. And I, I would offer today that the Texas Bankers Association really wants to partner with you and all of our small businesses that, that borrowed PPP money. Um, we have set up on our website a link uh, where not only bankers go to uh, have their voices heard on, on this issue, but where small business borrowers can go. Um, the link, and I can provide this to Wayne, is www.texasbankers.com slash borrowers. And if you've got small business borrowers who want to reach out to their member of Congress, it's terribly easy. Uh, the, the user uh, types in their, their address and it loads up uh, their member of Congress. So they're members of Congress, the senators and, and their member. So it's terribly easy, but we really think that this is an opportunity for the business community writ large to work together on something that's terribly important to the resilience of our economy. We wanna make sure these loans are able to come off the books of our businesses as well as our banks so we can focus on recovery uh, and not paperwork and bureaucracy. So the Texas Bankers Association is absolutely committed uh, to, to that effort. Uh, one of the reasons why we are so committed to making forgiveness easy is because when the PPP program comes to an end, when coronavirus is, is a thing of the past and we have a vaccine and those types of things, your community bankers are still gonna be there with you. Uh, you're gonna see them every day in the grocery store or at church or on, at the ball fields and those types of things. And you know this is really important for our banks to have that connectivity with the needs of their small business uh, borrowers. Um, so I, I do thank all of our community banks in the state of Texas for what they've done and thank our small businesses uh, for doing what they've done to keep jobs in the communities and to keep the doors open. And Wayne, I'll touch on one other issue uh, relatively quickly. And then uh, after that, I believe we'll, we'll do some Q&A if that's what you'd like to do. But uh, the other issue is on liability protection for business. Uh, Senator John Cornyn has been leading this fight in the United States Senate, uh, uh, and he's been doing that not only for Texas, but, but really for, for the nation. Um, and he's proposed a bill that would basically uh, provide liability protection to businesses that are open uh, as we still continue to deal with coronavirus, 
um, uh, to protect them from, from uh, lawsuits that are unreasonable. Um, the legislation is not just a free pass uh, by any means. Certainly businesses, uh, uh, universities, and uh, educational institutions as well uh, would qualify under his bill. Um, but uh, they have to follow the best standard practices, for example, CDC guidance and, and, and the like. But uh, I will tell you that um, this is a really important issue for our banks as well, because um, many of you may have noticed the, the banks have never closed. And if the banks had closed, that would be a huge problem for our economy. Uh, we've stayed open. Our employees have been deemed essential uh, because we want to make sure that whether you're a public or a private sector employee, you can still get your paychecks processed that folks can still go to the grocery store and buy food and buy medicine. And all of your businesses that you're trying to keep open during, during this time frame, uh, we wanna make sure that those transactions could be supported by your bank. So this liability protection issue is important for you and it's important for, for uh, our, our banks. Now, if Washington continues to be log jammed uh, with election year politics, like they are on many of these issues, um, we may be going to our state legislative leaders to address this in the upcoming uh, session uh, in January when, when it begins. Now, I will tell you all, uh, you're blessed. You have excellent representation. Uh, Senator Nichols and Representative Clardy are very respected. They are effective leaders, and uh, we really appreciate what they do uh, very, very much. I guess um, before I kind of wrap up my remarks, uh, I do want to salute Dr. Gordon and Stephen F. Austin University for your banking program. Uh, David Kaiser and the team have been building a, really the next generation of banking leaders who are going to serve uh, the business and industry needs uh, of East Texas. So we're very, very grateful uh, for that. At the end of the day, uh, Texas small businesses, our, our ag communities, oil and gas, all of these are inextricably linked to a healthy banking system in the state of Texas. And it's why we want to work with you. Um, our bankers like you are here for the long haul. It's about relationships, partnerships, and in, in many cases, it's really about friendships as well. And this is what's going to help keep Texas economically resilient during COVID. And it's what will make the Texas economy lead the nation out of the pandemic. So again, Wayne, I wanna thank you, the Nacogdoches uh, County Chamber, uh, and, and we really appreciate your, your leadership from the banking community perspective. And with that, uh, I hope I've uh, kept within my time frame, and uh, I'll give it back to you. Well, thank you very much, Chris. And uh, the good news from where I sit is you addressed many of the questions that I had jotted down. Uh, I, I will tell you that on liability protection, you'll be interested in knowing this chamber did weigh in with our congressional delegation on the importance of that. Uh, Senator Cruz did convey to us last week that he wasn't overly optimistic that that bill is going to pass on the federal level because of the reluctance of the House to embrace uh, to embrace that uh, legislation. So I suspect that uh, you and the other uh, trade association representatives will be uh, addressing that issue on, on the state level. Is that correct? You're spot on. Uh, the, the problem is, and everyone on the call can appreciate this, we're in the midst of a presidential uh, election year and really a presidential election year like, like no other. Uh, the fact that we have the ongoing uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic, uh, we're all trying to deal with that. Uh, in some communities across the country, we have uh, social unrest and there's a great deal of uncertainty that lies ahead. And again, it's one of these reasons why we're trying to fight for these things like the forgiveness element and for the liability protections, because we can't see uh, terribly far uh, down the horizon. I think if it were up to those of us on this call, um, we, we could move forward. We would, uh, uh, we would uh, improvise, adapt and overcome, right? Um, but that's not always how Washington works, especially in an election year. And that's what's that's what's happening. I don't know if we'll succeed on the forgiveness effort, but I can tell you the banking community is going to, to do everything we can to stand with our small business folks. We don't know if we're going to get the liability protections, but the banking community is going to fight alongside you in order to get that done uh, because we believe so strongly in it, um, because that's what you need uh, to get back to work and to get our economy uh, back in business. And my second question, Chris, is we heard from a, a representative from the restaurant industry some weeks ago that restaurateurs certainly were surprised to hear that this uh, 
there's going to be a pretty significant tax liability the way that they're interpreting it right now uh, for those that receive PPP funds. Uh, is anybody doing anything to help address that issue? Well, that's another issue that that uh, the Texas Bankers Association has been communicating with our members of Congress on. Um, I, I have a, a deep concern that come uh, next April, there will be a lot of PPP borrowers who will discover, hey, I, I owe tax uh, on those PPP uh, loan funds. I don't think that that's, that was ever the intent of Congress, uh, but that is the result and certainly the way the IRS is interpreting that. So uh, again, here we are in the midst of this highly volatile political environment, um, and there are major issues, whether it's forgiveness, liability protections, or the potential tax liability, uh, tax liabilities that are impacting our small businesses. We need Congress to come together right now. And um, I will tell you again, I, I think in Texas, we're blessed. We've got good leadership, folks who listen uh, to, to our issues. It's really the congressional leadership. It's at that level where the decisions are being made. Um, uh, just, over the weekend, uh, Mark Meadows from the White House, Senator McConnell uh, and uh, Leader McCarthy on the House side have said, hey, we're ready to come back to the negotiating table. Um, uh, but uh, Senator Schumer uh, and Speaker Pelosi, unfortunately, and not trying to be political, it's just the facts, are, are not ready to be back at the table negotiating. And um, we got to get those folks in a room. And at the very least, let's get forgiveness done. Let's get liability protection done. And y'all fight over all the rest. Um, but these are things that they all got started and they all need to finish the job so that our businesses can get back to work. Um, I get pretty passionate about it because I see and hear from our banks all the time, our community bankers saying, hey, these are the issues that are still out there. Uh, for uh, our small businesses. And um, uh, again, Washington needs to finish the job. Donna McCollum from KTRE has a question. Donna? I'm sorry, Wayne, I thought you were going to read it for me. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I, I was just wondering, are there any regional trends to defaulted loans and how are things looking here at East Texas? Uh, and, you know, your suggestions to East Texans who are who may have alt loans already and having trouble paying them. What are banks doing for them? And are you scrutinizing the loan applications a little more closely? Well, uh, again, the relationships that our community banks have uh, in particular uh, with our small business borrowers are, are very good. And I think many bankers will say that they've had uh, uh, the best communication they've ever had with their with their borrowers during COVID because it's, it's important to the banking industry that our small businesses uh, uh, remain in operation. Um, in terms of working with their borrowers, that's taking place across the board. It was encouraged by our federal regulators but I will tell you, it doesn't take a regulator to tell a community banker that they should work with their uh, borrowers, especially in, in a time of crisis, and that's what they've been doing. So the best advice that we could give is to work with your community banker. I can tell you our trade association, as well as our banks, are talking to their regulators uh, and the leaders in Washington uh, to try and ensure that consumers are not put in a bad spot. I mean, again, this is a national crisis and a national emergency. So uh, our banks are standing ready to work with our borrowers. And in the meantime, we're going to continue to, to, to work with Washington to, to ensure that we don't get to a point uh, where consumers are in trouble. Thank you, Chris. Any other questions for Chris? Well, Chris, that's a great sign. It appears that you've taken <laughs> care of all of the uh, questions. Or, or a really bad sign, Wayne. <laughs> Not at all. Well, first of all, I want to thank uh, Rusty for taking time to, to introduce you today. And uh, we're honored that Rusty is chair-elect of the Texas Bankers Association. And uh, uh, it shows the good judgment of you and your, your members and your colleagues uh, in selecting uh, somebody with his skills, abilities, and attributes. And uh, the second thing I want to thank you, Chris. I know this is a busy time for you, but uh, uh, this is extraordinarily helpful for uh, our members to have a clear understanding of what the finance community looks like in in, in Texas. So uh, any final thoughts? No, just if anyone has any questions about the policy issues that we raised today, and if you'd like to have a further conversation, don't hesitate to reach out to us. 
Um, uh, my, my email address is cfurlow at texasbankers.com. And uh, certainly you can always reach out to, to, to Rusty uh, as a leader in our organization or to any of the community banks uh, uh, there in East Texas. Well, thank you again, Chris. And you're welcome to stay on and monitor the call. If you have the time, uh, we'd, uh, we'd be uh, delighted to have you. Uh, having said that, we'll move on. I'm pleased to introduce the president of uh, Stephen F. Austin State University, Dr. Scott Gordon. Good morning, Dr. Gordon. Good morning. It's great to be on the call with so many of our wonderful bankers, except for except for Jimmy Mize. But at any rate, um, <clears throat> hope everybody is doing well. You know, I, I got up this morning and I, I looked at the uh, the calendar and it was one year ago today I arrived in deep east Texas. And I, I could tell you that uh, there isn't a better community or a, a better university in the country. Uh, and, and there are so many exciting things happening here, but uh, um, I am on chapter 15 of my book um, of my first year. Um, I never thought going into this academic year that we would be uh, shutting the university down for anything other than COVID-19, but it turns out we did, and that was the hurricane that uh, uh, for us, thankfully, was, was a non-event for well, I should say for most people in, in, uh, in Nacogdoches, um, I know east of us was hit very hard and, and our thoughts are with them. But uh, we canceled classes uh, Thursday and Friday uh, in preparation for what we thought was going to be a, <clears throat> a pretty bad storm. Um, in, uh, you know, hindsight 2020, uh, the storm didn't hit us, but nonetheless, I think it was good to be safe uh, rather than sorry. And so, you know, we got off to a little bit of a bumpy start here. Uh, classes started last Monday. So Thursday and Friday, we were off. We're back at it um, here today. Actually started back yesterday. Um, our enrollment has increased just a little bit. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll start to see a, a slowdown of some of that movement, but we do remain flat. And I think I mentioned to this group before, um, flat is the new up in this kind of uh, pandemic situation. And uh, I'm happy, but I'm not satisfied. Um, we are in the midst of uh, developing some very interesting, unique, and, and innovative uh, goals, initiatives, strategies, and partnerships um, this academic year in preparation for uh, fall of 21. Uh, even though fall of 20 is still kind of not yet in the books, we're working on fall of 21. And, and, and I think uh, what you're going to find is, is uh, we're going to be looking at a variety of new initiatives and, and like I said, partnerships and, and strategies and uh, really become a, uh, the model for higher education in uh, not just Texas, but, but in the United States. And uh, I put together earlier um, this summer a team called the Lumberjack Innovation Team. And this innovation team consists of dozens of faculty, staff, and students from around campus. And uh, what they are coming up with is, is really um, refreshing and new. And uh, um, we're getting, the, the campus is going to get a preview of, of some of the ideas and concepts they're thinking about tomorrow afternoon where they have a town hall. And then stay tuned. I will be giving a presentation at Rotary uh, October 14th where I'll go into some details on, on some of these, uh, these new initiatives. Um, <clears throat> one thing I will say is that everybody on this call will be either benefiting or part of these new initiatives. And uh, it's very exciting that, uh, that we, we get to, as a community, a university and, and greater Nacogdoches community, um, really all together become involved with, with uh, the direction that, that, that we will be going. Um, we are starting to develop a, a little bit of uh, some normalcy. Um, many of you probably know that uh, Saturday, our football team will be at uh, University of Texas El Paso and will be playing um, their first ball game, football game of the year. 
Um, volleyball starts this weekend, Friday and Saturday. Women's soccer starts this weekend. So we'll start having some, some action on campus. Um, we are, again, monitoring our uh, COVID cases on campus. Um, all of that information is on our website for the public to see. Um, we are, um, I believe now we have two students in isolation, um, but we have about 200 beds that we, uh, we have in, in, uh, in waiting. So uh, we're hopefully gonna be able to keep things in check. Many of you, uh, if you're a business owner, saw a letter that was sent out, a joint letter from, from the, uh, the city, uh, the city manager, the mayor, uh, myself, uh, Chief of uh, UPD, Chief of Nacogdoches PD, uh, just reminding people that, uh, you know, look, we're all in this together and, you know, we have to uh, keep in mind safety and uh, wearing our masks, uh, social distancing and, and so on. But uh, yeah, what a what a interesting start to the semester. It was a hurricane that, that sent us home and not, not COVID-19. So uh, let's just hope we can keep everything in check, keep the storms away and, uh, and have a great semester. So uh, with that, I'll take any questions. Any questions for Dr. Gordon? Well, Dr. Gordon, again, thank you. And that's exciting news. We'll look forward to find out what this new initiative is. Yes, we're gonna keep you in suspense for a little bit, but uh, I think uh, many of you will be uh, ecstatic about uh, some of these initiatives. That's fantastic. From the hospitality industry, would you welcome the executive director of the Nacogdoches uh, Convention and Visitors Bureau, uh, Sherry Cheney Morgan. Good morning, Sherry. Good morning, Wayne. Good morning, friends. Um, I wanted to go over briefly what the effect of COVID-19 has been on our hotel occup occupancy tax collection. So we started to see the effects um, fully back in April. And at that point, our hot tax collection was down 48, a little over 48% over what we saw in April of 2019. In May, it was down 37.3 year over year. In June, 37.5. And the latest numbers that we have are for July, and um, we were down 32% from July of last year. So, what we're seeing here on a month-to-month -month basis is that um, our decrease is lessening. And so that's that's a positive sign for us. Year to date, we're down 27.7% and our running 12 is down a little over 20%. Um, August will be a strong month across the board for all of our lodging properties due to Hurricane Laura both the evacuation as well as the recovery for our friends to the east. Um, we did all of our hotels and lodging properties were full and booked in preparation for the hurricane. Um, of course, we never want to profit on the misfortune of others, but we were certainly thankful and grateful that we had the space to provide some comfort of shelter and safety to these people that were seeking it. Um, and we've just been contacted by the state emergency response to help with the relocation of some of our friends to the east that did see some of the devastation. Um, so that will be a boost, an injection into our economy as well. Um, in so much as hot tax stays that exceed 14 consecutive days um, do not remit. Um, the hotel occupancy tax. So um, that's sort of the status of where we are. And then the other thing that I think bears mentioning is I think a natural reasonable assumption would be that our hotels are at 100% occupancy more often than we actually are. Um, truthfully, if we see our, our median, what we consider good is like a 67% full. Um, and that takes into account rooms that are offline for repair or renovation um and other things such as that so um when you hear these numbers just to give you sort of a benchmark we're not 37.5 or 32 percent down from 100 percent um you know we're it's 32 percent down from probably you know like a 60 percent so um 
it is the best news that we could hope for given the time. Tonight, our new city manager, Mario Canizares, and director of finance, Pam Curbo, and myself will be presenting a proposal to city council for consideration of a subsidy plan to assist the CVB through these unprecedented global times. We are fully funded through 72.5% of hotel occupancy tax. Um, we are in no way funded at all through the city's general fund during normal times. Um, so as what is being proposed to council is um, from our budget, mainly it's going to come from our administrative costs, the cost of just us doing business um, and existing, you know, seven days a week. And um, Pam Kerbo and Mr. Canizares have put together a plan that will, as our need, the CVB's need decreases. So if we recover more quickly than forecasted, um, their assistance will will diminish in kind. So it'll be relative and we're looking at um, a three-year plan. On top of CVB making some very aggressive um, adjustments and cuts to our budget in ways that we can, um, that will not affect our ability to passionately market and promote Nacogdoches as a safe travel destination and to continue to provide outstanding customer service to those that we welcome to Nacogdoches daily. Um, so fortunately, we have a knack for a lot of things, um, and one of those being resiliency. So we are just unspeakably grateful to the city for considering a subsidy of this sort and always thankful for a community that understands the value of tourism. Um, yes, economically, we are an economic driver, but uh, just for the quality of life that tourism adds to our community. So we are ever grateful and ever thankful for the support that we see every day, and especially during this time when we are seeing some real financial need. So thank you for the time, and I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody might have. Thank you, Sherry. We all wish you success tonight in your presentation. Any questions for Sherry? Thank you, Sherry. We'll move on to uh, the Office of the Governor's Representative. Would you welcome the Regional Representative, Betty Rousseau? Good morning, Betty. Good morning, Wayne and everyone on the call. Uh, it's always a, a pleasure and an honor to be on these calls and thank you. Uh, honestly, I have nothing because the governor was focused on the hurricane coming in and the aftermath, so there were no, no uh, really big announcements that came out or any at all except for that. So um, I'm just here to let you know that I'm here to help you in any way. Betty, thank you, and thank you. To, uh, please extend our appreciation to the governor for all he's done with uh, Hurricane Laura and, and the folks down in the Gulf region. Uh, representing, uh, I, I, uh, Senator Nichols uh, is doing a, a, an education tour right now of all of his counties, so he could not join us today. I don't know if Representative Clarney is on board. I see Jerry, Jerry is with us. Yeah, um, Wayne, can you hear me? Yes, sir, I can. Okay, good, good. Uh, yeah, sorry, I've had a little uh, technical difficulty, so I'm joining by phone today. So, uh, with the board. You know, I would be happy to give a little uh, a state update. Um, you know, so far this year, it's been a, a, an unusual one, and sometimes the news has not always been good. Uh, I guess I start with the lucky. Uh, we did avoid uh, you know, significant damage, at least in our part of the state from Laura. Although our friends uh, you know, further south to the east have, have had uh, damage, but it looks like the brunt of it was in uh, in Louisiana. But uh, again, our thoughts and prayers to all those people. Uh, but uh, you know, I think we all could have used a little more rain, but uh, glad to avoid the wind. Um, in the meantime, on the COVID front, uh, the numbers are continuing to improve, and this is throughout Texas, not just in our region, but throughout the state, both urban areas and suburban areas. Uh, even the valley numbers are, are, are starting to trend better both as to uh, uh, fatalities, uh, and, but also, uh, and very importantly for the, the system, the hospitalizations have dropped, and particularly the acute uh, hospitalizations. Uh, and, and the infection rates, um, I think, have, have lowered. Uh, I will, as an aside here, 
note that there's been a lot of frustration uh, from a number of uh, counties and reporting uh, entities uh, about the accuracy of the numbers. Uh, and I think this is for a variety of reasons, not the least of which it, this is obviously a movie target. And so it's hard to get them in real time to match up place to place. Uh, but there are, I think, some notable glitches in the system, uh, particularly where you have individuals who have been tested multiple times uh, and sometimes with differing results. Uh, and that, that is another uh, area I've seen this uh, for constituent uh, uh, business constituent HD 11, where um, you get conflicting tests depending on who does it. And that's caused some problems as, as far as you know, operationally. Uh, and we're, we're looking into that. So, um, you know, but, but the, the good news, the biggest of a 30,000 foot view is that the, the uh, virus does seem to be uh, uh, slowing down in its spread. Uh, and I think that's in large part because people have taken the, the responsibility personally regardless of whether there was any kind of governmental order. But I think uh, as I've gone around and, and uh, traveled, uh, I think you see widespread usage of masks, which is a safe and prudent thing to do. Um, you know, I think people continue to exercise good hygiene policies. I, I know uh, uh, Dr. Gordon at SFA and, and local businesses have been, you know, really trying to preach this message to our students where we've seen uh, outbreaks in that population. And then I think our school districts uh, throughout uh, East Texas or or taking this very seriously we want to protect both the students and the teachers and the the, the folks at home so um you know i'm, I'm encouraged that uh, driving home uh the other day and with drove through palestine was happy to see friday night lights in the distance uh so some return to normalcy uh but we're um i think i think we're getting there we're on the right track uh you know and again i think our healthcare healthcare uh, professionals have really done an outstanding job of of stemming the tide and and, and keeping their stamina up uh, and we're in, uh, I think we've learned a lot of how to treat the disease, how to treat the virus, and, and uh, have seen good results from that. Uh, so, you know, I think we're on, on the right trajectory, but this is no time to declare victory. And let's uh, keep up the good work individually and collectively, and we'll come through that as well. But otherwise, uh, we are starting the, the um, political season in earnest after Labor Day. Uh, you may have noticed that there's an election coming up. Uh, the convention's wrapped up. And so that will be a, a subject of uh, some discussion, I'm sure, as we go along that route. So uh, congratulations. Everybody will start to receive more mail uh, and get to see more yard signs and campaign signs. So I'll, I'll try to do my best not to clutter mailboxes or your your, your optics uh, through the campaign season. But uh, uh, that should wrap up here. I believe the election day is November 3rd. Um, there is uh, There are some special elections around the state that don't affect us. Um, but it's uh, it, right now it does not appear that we will have any kind of a special session. Uh, we are continuing to get good numbers, as, as Jerry pointed out locally. Uh, the same sort of uh, observations are being made on the statewide level as to uh, what kind of shortfalls we're looking at, and uh, I think that the, the numbers are hardening. Uh, that Comptroller Hager gave us that you know we're looking at probably somewhere in the neighborhood of a, a eight to twelve billion dollar shortfall for the next biennium, uh, which is a significant hit, but in context of a nearly quarter trillion, or actually a quarter trillion dollar budget, uh, you know, it's, it's a significant percentage, but, but certainly not uh, something that we can't deal with through a variety of, of um, you know, approaches, whether that's be reduced spending at the state level, uh, and I'm sure there's going to be a, a, some, some analysis of additional revenues, uh, but I wouldn't uh, get overly concerned that you will see a, a rise in taxes, and certainly we'll never see a, a, a state income tax. Uh, not the least wish, because we all voted for that for the, as a constitutional amendment. So, with that, Wayne, uh, I will kick it back to you. Happy to answer any questions uh, anybody may have, um, and I'm looking forward to uh, a happy Labor Day weekend. Thank you, Representative Carney. Any any questions for Representative Carney? If not, thank you very much. We appreciate right. it. Thank, thank you. Uh, for our regional economic update, would you welcome the president and CEO of the Texas Forest Country Partnership, Nancy Windham. Good morning, Nancy. Good morning. Thank you. It's good to be here. Um, just want to give a couple of shout outs for the bankers that are still on the call and for the Nacogdoches, Nacogdoches County Chamber of Commerce. 
I was in banking for 11 years before I started my professional economic development profession. And it was at a bank in Nacogdoches, and I see Rick Harrison still on the call. Um, it was at Timberland Savings that I had the opportunity of being a chamber rep and I volunteered there at the Nacogdoches Chamber. And that's where it all started. Lots of mentors took me under wing, uh, but the banking industry was what really set the, the pace uh, for getting involved with Nacogdoches, Nacogdoches County and economic development. And I just wanted to say thank you for all those that helped start that path. And then I got into economic development and I'm still here after about 35, 36 years. So thanks again. So that, enough of that, but y'all have all heard, most of you have heard the story. Uh, Rick happens to know all of the nights and weekends that we worked uh, departmentalizing Timberland Savings long, long time ago. So thanks for all those past relationships and the ones that we have today. I could, cannot say thanks enough for all of our banks. And I get so many compliments from people because we have local community banks and our bankers work with our small business and work with the individuals and we work with the small business development center and all those of you that are out there trying to help keep jobs create jobs our banking industry is essential to to that so kudos to everybody for working together my report today is a little bit different uh, than it has been in the past we had a hurricane and for regional report, I want to start out with a visit with DETCOG that covers the same 12 counties as the Texas Forest Country Partnership. Uh, the good news is they have filled the position that was open for disaster recovery. Uh, there is still one position that is open for economic development. It is in the grant writing position. I posted on the chat box uh, the DETCOG website please go there and talk to bob bashaw if you're interested in that position or you know of someone that is great news is they have hired a manager of broadband it has grown as you all know broadband is um almost at the top of the list of, of things that needs to be addressed and that our region uh, as all of texas and everybody has needs to have connectivity but they have hired a full-time manager of that position and that announcement will come out shortly they have approved the network design for the 12 counties. Initially, it included only just the ones in the disaster area, but because of additional funding and because of some entities that have stepped up to the plate, we now have all 12 counties involved in that. The cost estimate for a mile is $35,000, a total of about $14 million. That is just for our region. If you're on, for you, those of you that have your calendar marked November the 18th, <clears throat> it probably, it's not official, but it will probably be our virtual economic development summit. But we have dedicated the main portion, the educational part of that meeting to broadband. And we're bringing together Deck Cog, Lonnie Hunt, uh, the Temple Foundation, Wynn Rosser, and then uh, uh, Connected Nations. Uh, Jennifer will be uh, a panel that will discuss that. And of course, the highlight will be our legislative panel um, on that meeting. So be sure you mark that date down and you'll see something uh, coming out soon. Then to visit with D Tidham, um, if, for those of you that do not know who Tidham is, the Texas Division of Emergency Management. And they have a director here called Mike, his name is Mike Claude. And he provided the information for me this morning. Just quickly, at the peak of the storm, the East Texas, the Deep East Texas Electric Co-op reported 25,474 outages across an eight-county system. As of today, there are only 4,872 outages. I have a detailed report of that, but you can see how quickly they have been working to restore service to those counties. As of today, Jasper, Newton, Sabine, and Shelby counties have no unmet needs. Uh, there is a new district coordinator for Tetum, and his name is Pont Gonzalez. Uh, and they're looking forward to get everybody on back today. So um, Roger Lindsay is on the call. He may have something additional he would like to report from Encore. 
Um, and I have, I'm not me, but I sent to Kelly. She's going to be sharing a Perryman report uh, that is a, a, a report on the effect of Hurricane Laura to our region and the net impact could include losses to the U.S. economy of nearly $14 billion in gross product and 15,500 job. That's years of employment when the multiplier effects are considered. So it, it has devastated our area in some way. Yes, we our Nacogdoches County did dodge a huge bullet, but as we do that, as someone mentioned earlier, someone else caught the brunt, brunt in. But as on a regional basis, uh, that's kind of like an, an overview. And Roger, I don't know if you have anything else you would like to add for um, Encore because it is in our region, specifically Nacogdoches and Angelina counties. I don't, I don't Nancy. I would just tell you that uh, our storm restoration efforts went very well here. We at the peak of, uh, of course, in the in your Texas Forest Country Partnership area, we are the top two counties up here, top two or three counties, and we had maybe two thousand folks out of power at the peak so it it did not strike us as bad as it did our partners to the east and to the south so we're not a whole lot to report here we had a whole army ready to go um and we you know since then sent those folks to where their greatest need is and so we're we're good here um but i will if anybody has any kind of concerns around that they can address that with me offline please Thank you, Nancy, and thank you, Roger. We appreciate that. That's it. Okay, something a little bit different, but that's what we've been working with over the last week. <laughs> well, the uh, hurricane was certainly a, a new factor for us to consider here in, in East Texas, so thank you. Uh, is uh, Larissa Philpot with us? I don't see Larissa or Amy. So for the purpose of social services update, Gary Lee Ashcraft? Gary Lee. Wayne, I think he's having uh, technical difficulties. Not Gary Lee. Uh, that's what he says. Okay, well, you know, he had a tree fall on his house this week. So yeah. uh, we're all blessed okay. that he wasn't and Charlotte wasn't hurt. So that's the good news. But if we get Gary Lee back, we'll certainly invite him to join us. NISD update. Les Linebarger, good morning, sir. Good morning, Wayne. It's uh, good to see you all. Uh, teacher laptops arrived Monday in the district and our technology staff have started the process of delivering those to uh, around the district this morning. The district purchased 624 laptops for teachers, curriculum staff, administrators, librarians, and nurses. Really anyone who has contact with students and would benefit from the flexibility provided by the new devices is receiving one this week. The Board of Trustees paved the way for this purchase by freeing up the money to buy those laptops, and we want to thank them for that. And a part of this purchase is that obviously we're preparing for the possibility of a campus or school district closure later this academic year because of the pandemic. New student devices, which were purchased through an agreement worked out with the state, will arrive later this fall. The good news, uh, the state is sharing half the cost of the student laptops and tablets. And then finally, classes begin Tuesday, September 8th in uh, Nacogdoches ISD. Our schools are contacting their students about which will be on campus in the opening four weeks as NISD phases in having children attend face-to-face -face instruction. Obviously, there's a lot of things happening right now in, this week in our district. Wayne, that's all I've got. Les, thank you very much. Any questions of Les? Gary, were, Gary Lee, were you able to resolve your technical issue? Well, apparently not. So we'll catch up with Gary Lee next week. Uh, first of all, again, thank you to all our presenters, especially Chris for joining us from the main effort, main te the Texas Bankers Association. I want to thank all of you folks for taking time out of your busy schedules to be a part of it and all of our presenters here today. And uh, we hope you all have a, a successful and prosperous week. This concludes our call.